Good morning. Anybody get wet coming in? Um, occasionally I'll have people ask me to give a talk on a particular topic. Uh, sometimes people want to know what the Bible has to say about human sexuality, about relationships, about the end times. Um, there's one topic almost no one asks me to talk about, and that topic is money. And uh, guess what today's topic is? Yeah, not by popular demand. <laughs> and uh, whenever I talk about money, I start with this uh, kind of caveat. My intention is only to discuss how God views our financial resources, our material possessions. I'm not trying to get anything. Uh, so one of the first things I tell you is this. If you feel at all as though today is a setup for trying to get you to give more in the offering today, which uh, our tradition is we do that at the end of our service, you're off the hook. Like you don't have to give anything. No questions asked because I'm not attempting to get more from you. I would really like to get something into you today. And so we're going to be in Mark, the 10th chapter. And uh, Jesus started on his way. He's about to take a trip. He's just beginning. A man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Most of us don't actually know what it's like to have ridiculous amounts of money. But when you do, an unkind truth is, is that a lot of people don't love you. They love what you have and what they might get from you. And Jesus loved him and looked at him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me at this the man's face fell he went away sad because he had great wealth jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of god the disciples were amazed at his words but jesus said again children how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. That's a really strong word. He didn't say with man, it's improbable, it's unlikely, it's hard. Entering the kingdom of God on our own is not possible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, this is a story of the rich young ruler. And if you were paying really close attention to all the words, you'll find out that this passage doesn't tell us anything other than he was rich. If you look in uh, Matthew's gospel, you discover that he was young. And in Luke's gospel, he was a ruler. So he was a person of some authority, whether that was civil authority or religious authority, we don't know. And, uh, but we know he was a rich young ruler. Now, if you have, if you still carry any currency, I know a lot of people uh, uh, don't mess with cash all that much. Uh, we can do things electronically now. But if you have any currency, there's a statement that exists on all American currency. And it says, in God we 
trust. Now, it wasn't always so. American currency didn't always have that on. The first time it ever appeared was on a two-cent piece following the Civil War. They were attempting to unify the nation after its unbelievably bitter civil war, and one thing that both sides believed in was God, and so they wanted everyone to focus on at least something we can believe in. And then uh, somewhere in the mid-50s, uh, as communism was rising and as it was known as an atheistic society, democracy in the United States wanted to separate and distinguish itself from an atheistic uh, political system. And so that's when uh, the law was passed to include in God we trust on every single piece of of currency, and there have been a couple of mistakes uh, that have gone by, and there actually was one president who said that he didn't want that included, not for the reason that you might think, uh, not because he thought that uh, uh, church and state should be so separate as to not even acknowledge the existence of God, but he just thought it was the way the country was living, it was hypocritical to say that. That's interesting. I wonder what he would say now. Uh, There's something not included on American currency. It's included on almost everything else that you buy. And it's a warning label. Uh, there's all kinds of warnings for the things that we handle and purchase and, and gain in our lives. Uh, but there probably should be a warning label that basically says too much money can be hazardous, hazardous to your health and well-being. How is that possible? Uh, while money can improve our life in many ways, and all of us have experienced that, money also has the capacity to magnify problems that cannot solve. Some things actually get worse when you have more. Um, I've done ministry quite a few years, and what I can tell you is one of the sadder things to see is when a family of means, a significant person in that family passes away, and then watch the family turn on each other, trying to get the possessions and some of the most bitter and uh, challenging statements that people can make to each other in a season of grief actually come over greed. That their greed outweighs their grief. It's an astonishing thing. Uh, it increases pressure to be dishonest. Like if you don't have anything to give and somebody says, can you help me out? You just go, I'm sorry, I, I don't have anything. But when you have something, you don't feel like, I actually have something. I don't think you're a good risk or a good cause. I'm not going to contribute. So you just, you tend to say things that aren't true. And money can distract us from dealing with very important issues. When you don't have any options, you kind of have to deal with life as it comes. But, but money can give us lots of distracting options to avoid dealing with real things. And money can provide access to unhealthy options. Money can also make promises that it cannot keep. The assumption is, is that if I have more money, then my life will be set. Money can't protect you from grief. Money can't protect you from betrayal. In fact, if your faith is in money, at the very time you need your faith the most, it will not be available to you. Because there's some things in life you just can't buy. Money can distort your view of life. If you have enough money, you can actually segregate yourself from people who really struggle and have a lot less or have nothing at all. And if you have a lot of money, it's very easy to start seeing people as tools to get things done rather than as people. And if you have too little money or too much money, you would be surprised what you would do. Um, does anybody remember here a couple years ago when the, the mega lotto thing got up to over $1 billion? Does anybody remember that? Nobody came to me, not one person. I had lots of people come and say, I just want you to know if I win, the church is going to do okay. Yeah. I had lots of that. I didn't have one person come to me and say, $1 billion is way too much money. I'm going to sit this one out. I don't think I can handle that much money. Every single one of us believes we can handle however much money we get. And that's not necessarily true. Um, we can make the bottom line a decider for our decisions in life. 
There are people who choose a vocation in life, an occupation in life, not based on their gifts or their strengths or their talents or their passions. They do it on how much does that position make? So, you know, well, they make a lot of money. Well, then I'll do that. And then they wind up being in a job that drains their soul to, to some kind of bitter and and brittle dryness, and they can't quite seem to, to figure out why life is so hard. Their assumption is my life will be good if I have more. There are people who the reason they pick the school that they go to is, is about what kind of job it will provide. There are people who've made decisions on who they're going to marry based on money. And what you have to know is that those marriages often struggle at profound levels. A passion for money can actually distort our discernment. It can cause us to override our intuition in marriage and friendships and in lots of things. And money can make us unapologetic. There are things that you can say and the way that you treat people that you just ignore because those people can be replaced in my life. I can get more. It really should come with a warning label. Jesus says some pretty powerful things to this rich young ruler, but he's not trying to make a point. He's trying to make a disciple. That's a very different thing. What's interesting is that grace deals with us as individuals. We don't all have the same weaknesses and the same challenges. That's why Jesus doesn't ask everybody who follows him to sell all that they have and give everything to the poor and then come follow him. We all have things that have a lot of control in our life, and Jesus deals specifically with them. That means grace is not efficient. The Bible doesn't say grace is efficient. The Bible says grace is sufficient. There's a difference. So three things we all want. We all wish we were wealthy. We all wish we were young. We all wish we had authority. And yet, Jesus acknowledges to this rich young ruler, it's not enough. A lot of people, when they figure out they can't buy God, will try to bypass him. So if I have these things in my life, I will feel safe, I will feel important, I will feel secure. And those things wind up proving to not be true. We're unprepared for the reality of our assumptions if we have more. If I have more, we don't realize I am going to feel more responsible. Lots of us aren't ready for that. And if we have more, we will have more to risk. And lots of us aren't ready for that. So Jesus actually in this conversation identifies some strengths in the young man before he goes to the glaring weakness. And, and he says this, he says, don't take life, honor your marriage vows. Do not take what does not belong to you. Do not say things that are not true about someone. That would be false witness. Do not say things that are not true to someone. That's a way to take advantage of them. Honor your parents. Like he puts this list out and the young man is very excited because he's actually been doing these things since he was a boy. And, and, and so he just tells Jesus, I've, these things are all important to me. They're valuable to me. I've been doing this since I was a boy. And then Jesus waits to focus on the first commandment. The first commandment is no other gods before me. And Jesus provides the option for the young man to see where his highest priority really is. Sell everything. Give everything to those who have nothing. Follow me. And the young man's face fell. He was very sad. Sometimes the loss of something that has become too important in our lives is not just a sadness. There's a gravity to it that's unshakable. We almost feel like our life is over. If I lose that job, if I lose that money, if I lose that house, if I lose that possession, that's too much for me to bear. And Jesus would say that maybe that's too important in your life. 
He has a way of pointing out whatever the counterfeit God is in our life. He sees what we depend on to find our meaning and to feel secure and to shape our identity. He, it was something, we all have things that when we lose them, we feel bad about it. That's appropriate. But then to think, I don't know if I can go on. I, my life is over. Jesus would say, that's not appropriate. It's defining you. It's too important. So this young man who has a lot probably starts thinking, if I had none of my wealth, how would people treat me? How would they treat a person who gave everything they had away, has everything everybody wants, just gave it away? What would his future look like? Now, when you hear a message like this, you're saying, well, pastor, are you saying that we shouldn't set aside anything for retirement? And that's not what I'm saying. That's not what this message is about. Jesus does not ask everyone to give everything. Jesus does ask everyone to give something. Everyone. So the rich young ruler, what was revealed is that his trust was in his possessions and his wealth, not in God. He had seen what poverty looked like. That was not going to happen to him. Without wealth, who would he be? Without wealth, what would he do? Without wealth, how would he survive? Without wealth, who would take him seriously? Everything revolved around his wealth, and he goes away sorrowful. So I'm going to take the few minutes I have left to talk about developing a strategy for managing our wealth, because I do hope you know that while you know someone who has a lot more than you, as a rule in our country, we have a lot more than most people in the rest of the world. How many did know that? Yeah. So what's a strategy? And uh, the first thing I would say is start with the assumption that you're already infected. You're already corrupted. Um, the, the power of money, of wealth, to distort our view is actually really incredible. Uh, it helps us, it, it forces us to see people differently. When you see people who have a lot less than you, how do you think about them? Do you consider them incapable of helping themselves or unwilling to help themselves? And how do you see people who have a lot more than you? Do you think that they cheated and connived or was just lucky and, and they were in a place that you weren't in and so that's why, why they got it? We start distorting our views of people. Either they're, they're in, un, incapable of, of making a difference. Who knows? They might have done a lot better than us if they had the same opportunities. We actually don't know that. Uh, here's, a, here's another thing. We can actually live on less than we earn. We have all lived on less than we have right now. Every one of us. But when we make more, what do we do? We spend more. Because that's the way our culture teaches us to manage our resources. Um, we can all be more generous than we are. So why don't we? Why aren't we? Why is it always easier to consume than it is to contribute? So I'm going to recommend a generosity plan. I think everybody ought to create their own generosity plan. This, isn't, uh, this is what I'm asking everybody to do. I think everyone ought to create a generosity plan. First question to start with, what percentage of income are you willing to give away? Now, I have to tell you that the next thing I'm going to say might frustrate a number of people in the room and who are watching online. And my goal is not to frustrate. My goal is to bring some insight as to what Scripture has to say on this topic. And the Bible indicates that if we are unable to give away 10% of everything that we make, then we don't have money. Money has us. That there's something about crossing that threshold of 10% that we actually start getting a different view of money and a different view of life. 
And people who do that generally see the resources they have as a gift from God. And people who don't do that generally see that God hasn't given them enough, so they kind of blame God. Or, or they will tend to say, look, I appreciate what you're saying, but I actually earned. God didn't give me anything. I earned everything that I have. And, and I have no doubt they have worked hard in their life. But who gave them the ability, and who gave them the knowledge, and who gave them the skill, and who gave them the opportunity? And all of those, all of those were gifts from God. But when we're unwilling to let go of something, we don't tend to see it that way. Now, another recommendation that I have is reduce debt. Pay down as much debt as you possibly can, as quick as you can. Because a lot of times, we have an impulse towards generosity. We just can't pay it off. It's one of the most frustrating things to me is I will go in to buy something, and they don't try to sell me a product. They try to sell me the payments. Has anybody else done that? I'll go in and they say, well, in fact, the first question, when I went to buy a car, you know what the first question was? The first question was not, what kind of car are you interested in? The first question is, what kind of payment do you think you can afford? Because that's how our culture thinks. If we can pay down debt, we'll actually have more. And here's the thing about paying down debt. When you pay down debt, all the money that you pay in interest, you get to keep. When you're not in debt, that's, that's how that works. I also recommend that you start a generosity savings account. Like I know some people, they'll set aside some money for a future car that they'll need to buy, or some people will set aside some money for a vacation that they want to go on. Wouldn't it be cool if we could set aside some money for being able to respond in generous in generosity when something or someone was in need? And instead of going, oh, I really wish I could help. I wonder where I could get it. You just like, you know what? I've actually been preparing for this moment and they have something to give. Now, some people can actually do more than 10%. And I know you're sitting here going and say, Pastor, I had to walk through rain to get into this room. And this is what you're talking about. You should have saved this for some sunny day. It was sunny yesterday, and you weren't here, so. Uh, my wife and I have actually consistently given over 10% of our resources. I don't say that to try to brag or impress. I'm not trying to earn anything. I am trying to learn something. I'm trying to learn how trustworthy God is. You can trust God with your life. By the way, there's another little caveat. I have heard this through the years. Pastor, there are people who, they make very little in life. They have significantly restricted income capacity. And to ask them to give 10%, that's just, that's just, it's, it's no way to treat the poor. And I've made an observation through the years. I have never had a person who has significant income limitations ever say that to me. In fact, almost to the person, they're kind of proud that they were able to do that. That argument is always made by people who have more than enough about people who have less. Because the truth is, they don't care that much for the poor or they would be generous. They care about keeping what they have and they're looking for a straw man argument. God says, once you cross the 10% threshold, you begin to see your life, him, your resources, and our world very differently. Some people say, ah, you're just trying to get our money. I'm not. I'm, I can tell you we do great things with the resources that are given to us. I'm more concerned that you are a generous person than that the object of your generosity would be this house. We have vision and we do some really remarkable things, but I'm not just trying to get more. Jesus looked at him and Jesus loved him and he wasn't going to drop this young man. He loved him enough to tell him the truth. What's really fascinating is that this story really is about two rich young 
rulers. There was another rich young ruler in that conversation who actually did the right thing. He had more riches than anyone could calculate. He had the wealth of heaven at his disposal. And that rich young ruler was willing to enter poverty far deeper than any of our imaginations. And he surrendered it all so that we could be rescued. Jesus gave it all. How many are grateful for him? I'm going to have the worship team come out. Let's just bow our heads this morning. What I'm hoping is that you'd be willing to hear the wisdom of God on how we handle our resources. And you may be here and your financial situation is tenuous enough that you're actually giving as much as is possible for this season of your life. And the first thing I want to say is that I think heaven knows that and values that. But I think heaven doesn't want to leave you there either. So there may be some adjustments that you can make as you keep moving forward that allow the impulse of your heart under grace. When you see something and, and you know it's, it's valuable, it has kingdom impact, it's going to make a difference. It's something that you can do to be able actually to have something in that moment to, to allow your hand to follow the impulse of your heart. It really is a remarkable thing. And when we do that, heaven seeps into our world. Life gets a lot more comfortable when we have more, but it doesn't get a lot more like heaven. It gets more like heaven when our hearts are transformed and our hands are open wide and we watch what God can do with what we're willing to trust him with. So Father, help us today. We, we all struggle with this from time to time. There may have been moments when we kind of stepped up and, and really trusted you, and then there's probably moments when we, we really worried about that. Would you help us take a, a different course of action than the man we read about today? Instead of our countenance falling and going away sad, would you help us continue to follow you in all things, including how we manage our resources? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.